Hello, everyone. Hope you're all doing super well. For those of you just joining or who are, the, it's your first time, you know, here in this virtual space, you are in the virtual world of the Institute for Art and Olfaction, where we are super pleased to host a talk with Mandy Aftel, the great Mandy Aftel, on the occasion of the republishing of her seminal book, Essence and Alchemy. Um, I'm Saskia. I'm the founder of the Institute for Art and Olfaction, and we're going to get started. Uh, probably for most of you, Mandy needs no introduction. No, nevertheless, it is my honor to introduce her. So Mandy Aftel started making natural perfumes almost 30 years ago. She creates each of her perfumes from the comprehensive collection of strikingly beautiful natural essences that she has assembled over the years from hidden quarters of the world. She hand blends and bottles her products in small batches in her Berkeley, California studio, and personally attends to every detail of the process in creating every product as the founder of Atelier Perfume, she has been hailed as one of the fragrance industry's quote, most prolific talents by Vogue and quote, an angel of alchemy by Vanity Fair. She is an advisor at the Institute for Art and Olfaction, thank you, Mandy, which has created the Aftel Award for Handmade Perfume in her honor. She pioneered the use of essential oils in home cooking with James Beard award-winning chef Daniel Patterson in their book, Aroma, The Magic of Essential Oils in Food and Fragrance. She recently opened, a not so recently, I guess, Mandy, huh? a couple of years ago, but a few years ago, she opened a museum called the Aftel Archive of Curious Sense. And most recently, most recently, uh, in addition to teaching and making her work, she has recently republished her seminal book, Essence in Alchemy. And that is what is bringing us here today. So Mandy, super welcome. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Hi. Hi, everybody I know, too. Hi. So Mandy, um, we're just going to launch right into it. We're going to launch into it with the book, as we discussed. So you originally published Essence and Alchemy in 2001. I have an early edition right here behind me, um, just over 20 years ago. And I'd like to start there. So what was the genesis of the book uh, in the beginning? Like, why did you decide to write it? I had had a perfume business um, with a friend. It was, uh, I think, the first natural perfume business. And we launched at Bergdorf Goodman's and... Um, and I made all the perfumes and it was very short lived. It kind of came to a bad end. And um, in the process of doing this perfume business, I had gotten very interested in natural essences and particularly their histories and books about them from the turn of the century. And by the time the business had collapsed, I was just over my head in terms of how much I loved the learning about the materials. And so I had written a book, I'd written a couple books before I wrote one book on a rock and roll star. And I wrote two books on psychology, which was what I was doing before. And um, my editor for my last psychology book said, why don't you write a, a book for me on perfume? And so, um, and so I did. And, um, and it was kind of, it was, it was long ago. And I loved doing the research for that book. And I loved putting in the bibliography, which was a path through all the books that I had found. And so that's how I ended up writing it. You mentioned very in passing that you wrote books about some a rock and roll star. Could you just let us know who that person was? Just, I, just for a little context. I, I wrote a book about Brian Jones, who was the founder of the Rolling Stones. And it was all based on oral history. And I got my way into the world of the Rolling Stones in the 70s and <laughs> met really interesting people and um, lived with Donovan, the singer, and his wife, who I'm still friends with. And uh, I like research a lot and I like going to the source. So that just threaded right through from my book on rock and roll to my book on perfume. Yeah, yeah, I know the research is super important to you, right? So, um, so I mean, 20 years on, you know, and I, it's sort of hard to ask you this question because it's hard to speak of one's own work, but what do you think the impact of uh, Essence and Alchemy has, has been? I have a couple thoughts too, but, you know. I am shocked it had such a big impact, really. I'm, sh I'm shocked anything I do has a big impact, to be honest. But I was shocked that Essence and Alchemy kind of grew because it seemed like um, this very personal exploration, the idea of thinking about perfume in terms of alchemy, which was something I had been studying and been very interested in. I had never seen anything like that till I wrote about it. I felt very out on a limb with a lot of what I said in that book. And the world of perfume was very different then. It wasn't as hospitable. So I think it was like a little snowball rolling down the hill that got bigger and bigger over time. And it ended up being published in 14 countries, including it's going to be published in Vietnam. And my Vietnamese publishers are somewhere among these squares and these pictures and by May in France, which seems incredible to me. And um, people just that book resonates for people in a way 
I'm honored and shocked by, <laughs> really. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those books that, uh, it's sort of one of the, there's, it's, there, there's like a few books that are the first books that people come to perfumery with. And yours is, I think, number one, you know, people come in through here with essence and alchemy in their minds. So I, th I think too, it relates to anyone who's interested in perfume, not just naturals, which is, yeah. my passion, but a lot of mixed media people really resonate with what's in the book and the interest in handmade perfume. And so I think it's not just people who are interested in naturals who've related to it. So why do you think that is, that it resonates also with mixed media folks? Is it the history maybe that people? I think a lot of mixed media people do work with naturals. And so that history is important to them. And there's a lot of working by hand in that book and a lot of thinking about the creative process and the creative process and scent. And also as a person, I'm not on a soapbox for naturals. So it's not, th that's not a point of view that's threaded through what I have to say. So right. I, th I think it feels welcoming to people yeah. to use a palette that's different than my own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's something that people often forget that while the while you yourself work with naturals, you're not you're not um you're not against other practices, you know. No. Yeah. But just you have your own preference. So why did you find yourself wanting to revise it? And and I asked this, I, we have a list of questions, so I'm trying to like make this seem spontaneous. But <laughs> I know you I know you know the answers, but it's nice to be able to tell the answers honestly and it was nice yeah. to put them down. Um, I reread the book a while ago. Uh, I don't know why I did, but I did. And I, I was shocked uh, by some of it and horrified, actually, um, about some of the writing about how to make perfume because I've been teaching. I've been teaching for a really long time, like 20 some years. And my teaching has grown uh, and my thinking and my concepts, all the things about creating perfume and having an art practice have grown as any art practice would grow. If you were diligent about it, you would discover things. So I looked back at where I was in the beginning of my career and I didn't know as much. I just didn't. And what I knew some of it was received from other people that were experts, but I didn't find it out myself. And I found I didn't actually agree with it over time. So when I looked at that, I felt like, oh my God, I looked at Foster, I said, I gotta fix this. You know, I gotta fix that part of it. So I reread I re it. And I was really happy that um, the historical research was still really held up. So that part, the research I had done on uh, a lot of the historical material was really um, well put together, well thought out. I still agreed with it. There certainly were things to update, like I had the word oriental in there, which was a word people use then that don't use now. So I had the opportunity to make about a hundred little changes, but you know, mostly, uh, so much of my thinking had changed. I really, I really, really wanted to uh, bring up the teaching and the composition and the how to make perfume and the supplies and all that stuff about the practice. I felt I really needed to address, particularly if people were using it as their first introduction to making perfume. So I set about to kind of add, add in things at a more basic level that I do in my class, not as advanced, but more basic and also just ways of thinking. Because for me, making perfume starts with thinking, knowing materials and thinking. So I wanted to put the thinking and the knowledge of materials back in into the book about where I was now. Are there any specific spots that you could, that you remember, like any specific sections of the book that you know you had to change drastically that you can think of? The whole um, composition chapter I went over, I kept the beginning and then I added about eight pages that mm. were never, never there before. And then I changed um, all the recipes. I looked at the recipes in horror, actually, so, not all of them, but some of them, I looked at them, I went, oh my God. Um, so I changed a lot of the recipes, the supplies, um, things like how long the dry down was, which was completely wrong. Just mm -hmm. I, there's about a hundred little things, but most of the changes are in recipes, supplies, and composition. I would say that's the major place where I made changes. And I included isolates, natural mm -hmm. isolates, which I really love and I really love working with. I included some about that, not a lot, but I included some, a nod to that, to CO2s, to things that have become more prevalent in my own practice since I began. So I added that stuff into that's I'd say is what's different. It must be, uh, you know, I, I kind of can empathize with the fact that when you're, you know, because we're all learning lifelong learners, right? I think yes. you're, you're quite open about that yourself. And then, but when you're publishing as you're learning, there must be that moment of looking back at old work and being like, oh no, you know, like. <laughs> I have that all the time. With yeah. I've written, 
when I look at it and whenever I look at it, I'm always feeling I need a seatbelt to just like stay in my chair and not, you know, think, oh my God, how did anybody <laughs> look at this? I feel like I, I'm a, as a human being, I'm a work in progress and yeah. hopefully learning and doing more better. And I certainly think that about my teaching that um, a lot of what goes on for me is my own learning and growing and along with being able to do things better. Well, I think it's, I mean, it takes a certain amount of courage to uh, publicly admit that you're a work. I mean, we're all a work in progress, but most of us are pretending not to be, right? So, yes. you know, I salute you. Um, so, so you mentioned in the, in the, briefly that there were some aspects of the book that, that were, that did withstand the test of time for you. And that was mostly the historical research and things like that. Are there any nuggets in there that you're still very attached to? Yeah, I, I love the stuff about sex. I think it's kind of completely fascinating. I mean, I could have added a whole lot more about that. I thought that was really, really interesting. The research I had done, a lot of the research I had done, I thought, boy, I could add to this. Even with the other books I've written, I found that just, just very, very, very interesting. The place perfume has had in people's lives, just the more that has come up about history. A lot of essences weren't in there because mm -hmm. they now, like say oud. Oud was not a big deal when I started. Now oud's a big deal. Um, there were certain things. I drew a line like around the isolates as well. And I'm putting that material into a book I'm working on, finishing up right now about the and museum. So I've, I'm moving along down the track. Excellent segue to section two of our questions, museum. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, Mandy, I know you're currently finalizing a book about your museum, which is the Actel Archive of Curious Sense. For those of us who don't know, it's in Berkeley and it's an absolute gem. Um, so let's start with sort of the, the museum itself. So what made you decide to start this museum? It's a, you know, it's a, it's a fear. I was thinking about this when I saw the question. I'd say the main reason I started the museum is I'm very lazy. Um, and I, people used to come visit me in my studio, which I'm sitting in now, and I had been collecting stuff. The, the, you know, in the very beginning, I got books and then I got postcards and then people knew I would buy stuff. So if someone had anything interesting, I would buy it. And mm. it wasn't a fortune either. So I would have it all over my house, literally in every room I was holding on to stuff. I had it. I have stuff in this. If I turned the camera, you'd see I have old prints. I just have a lot of stuff. And so when people come over, I'd be very excited. I'd show it to them. And then when they'd leave, I'd have to put it all away. And I used to kind of hate that because I was very lazy and my house was a complete mess. So I thought, you know, if I had this in one place, then when I wanted to share this world with people, I wouldn't have to put it away anymore. So somewhat it started with the idea that I could do that. And also with going to little tiny museums, which I looked at and foolishly thought, I bet I could do that. You know, I had a, a a kind of converted garage outside of my house and I thought, well, I think I could do that. And I wanted people to have the experience I had had when I stumbled into all this stuff that I felt was so beautiful and so interesting and so just sexy and smart and just so many things like, and I wanted people to have that experience and I wanted them to have it without marketing. So we set about to make the museum and we is just my husband and my son. There's almost no one here, just us. And we didn't know what we were doing. And it took us three years of that and expense and whatever, and, um, and lots of mistakes. And we got it put together and honestly, I didn't, I don't know what I was thinking, really. I didn't think anyone would come, but I wanted to do it anyways. I mean, we were just talking about that today. I thought at the most, maybe a couple people would come that no one, you know, that we'd be out there ourselves, which would have been okay with me with the books and the prints and the pictures. But I did it all because a lot of what I do, I do to please myself or I do to learn something. And I'm not that attached to doing things um because of what the rest of the world will think but lo and behold people came and and people not only came but they sent everybody they knew and so we just had a lot of people coming and and we have at least 50 percent are return visitors and we return visitors with another person in their family and um, and we can leave all the stuff out and never have to put it away which is just incredible and i can keep adding to it and when people come, they are really happy. 
And they are not only are they happy, but they're very um, grateful. It's like they always say, thank you for doing this. Thank you for putting, they just get in touch with everything I feel made people passionate about perfume, which for me is the materials, the history, the connection to us as people, the connection across the globe, it all takes place. And I go see every visitor, I talk to them, I ask them, you know, what they like. And it's just, it's glorious for me. I mean, I hope it's glorious for them, but I have a great time. And so I'm very, it's the best thing I ever did. I think what I like about the museum, you know, uh, amongst the collections and all that is that it's just, it is about that curiosity. I mean, it's aptly titled the Aftal Archive of Curious Sense. Like it's sort of, it lends itself to curiosity and discovery and there's little drawers and little, you know, it's pretty, pretty special. It feels yeah. like it's, it's an embodiment of essence and alchemy. Like I feel yeah. like it's essence and alchemy brought to everything I thought about in essence and alchemy. I kind of get to do out there because that was all a process of discovery that it's a continuation of that and being able to share it without marketing, which is yeah. very, very important to me. So are you creating new exhibitions for the museum all the time or how, how do you curate it? Like, how do you keep it fresh for yourself? You know, I, I love the getting new exhibits. We have some we have some ones that we've added recently. And um, our, the smelling takes place outside. I'm a complete COVID phobe. Um, mm. So we, we, we closed for a year and a half during lockdown and then, then we reopened, but we moved the smelling outdoors, which feels very safe. And it's in my garden where I can show off all my roses, which I love to do. And um, so we have that outside, but if COVID ever went away, I have a lot of ideas of new exhibits I'd like to do. So we added a Agarwood exhibit, an Oud exhibit, which is really spectacular. Um, and it's in honor of one of my students, Ross Ureri, who died, um, who was a genius incense maker and beloved human being on this planet and had taken so many classes with me. He knew every, I swear he knew everyone in every class. I can see every, the people who know him. He just was a special, very special human being. He made incense, I swear, with real tuberose and real, uh, um, real oud and real uh, ambergris, you name it, it was in his incense. So he, I inherited his oud collection and then my students crowdsourced marvelously, I can see them right sitting in front of me, uh, a fund and we got this amazing piece of oud, really a beautiful piece of oud. And then the person we got it from kicked in another piece. So people come and smell the oud. And then I got a master distiller through the incense world to, uh, I got some oud from him. So people just come and they really smell the real thing of this. So the oud okay. exhibit is spectacular. And then um, we, I also um, got this incredible book that I'm going to write a new book about called The Symbolorum. And it's uh, the first copper plate etchings of plants. This book has four centuries of pictures that are incredibly detailed and narrative, almost like Aesop's fables about plants and animals and us. And uh, so that exhibit is really, really speaks to me in a way the old books did. And I have things out there like a breakdown of rose where I have the, the four or five major rose aroma molecules that make up rose. So I can deconstruct rose. And I think if I had more room, I would add more exhibits like a breakdown of indole and jasmine. I'd start to take some of the essences apart into their component pieces and start to explain because naturals are such a cocktail of different molecules. It's fun to explain that to people. If I ever had more room or did more exhibits, that's the direction I'd go in right now. Um, okay, so I have a, a question which relates back to your writing, which is why, so I know you're, you've been working on a book about the museum for a couple of years now, um, and I think it's soon ready. So. Why did you uh, decide to write about the museum? Well, so many people wanted to take the museum home with them. Right. I have, I made, um, during, before lockdown, everybody could smell all the essences at, I have a huge perfume organ out there, like with 300 really incredible natural essences and people could smell everything. And there was always kind of a bottleneck at the organ, but after COVID not wanting to be, you know, the top Berkeley COVID, you know, hotspot, we stopped letting people smell at the organ. And so I made a guide to the organ and I divided it up into, you know, woods and resins and so on. And then I have an old herbal from the 1600s and I 
I, I printed a lot of the pictures of the plants, which are extremely beautiful. And then I, uh, I, I painted them. You want to give me one? Yeah. And so um, I made a guide to the organ so everybody could kind of um, see the plant material that went into um, the essences. And so most people who come to the museum ask if they can buy it, the guide to the organ. And that's part of the museum book. So I began to feel like people would like that education. They'd like to take it home. Here's one of the pictures I painted. This is a lavender. So I just felt like people wanted, wanted the information, wanted to take it home, or some people can't come. And I wanted to share to, to me, it's uh, the, everything in there is extremely beautiful. So I wanted people to have an experience of that beauty they could take home with them. And luckily I found a fantastic publisher who feels the same way. This is that book I was talking about. This isn't a plant one, but this, they thought the leopard and the lion were the same animal. Um, and so it has a lion's tail and a lion's mane, but a leopard's body. And it basically, the, the motto for this one, they all have little lessons, life lessons and stuff. And the one on this is, I think, like if I pounce, with, if you don't do something within three paces, you'll never do it, is basically what that's about. It's like, get on it or let it go, which is kind of a very modern idea. So it's just fascinated me. They're two inch black and white pictures and then I paint them. Yeah. Um, and there's quite a few beautiful ones. There's one with the beautiful sky, if I recall. So um, actually, Lisa's asking uh, when the museum book will be available, which is a great salient question. Um, I have to hand it in in November, and I think it comes out uh, next September, I think. September 23. September 23 is when it comes out. Okay, so like a year from now, basically. Yes. Yeah, it takes, it takes time to produce yes. these books, right? Yeah. Yes. And it's going to have a scented bookmark. Nice. <laughs> What's it going to smell like? I think frankincense because I nice. really love frankincense. Nice. Are there other micro museums or small museums that you take inspiration from, Mandy? Like, are there any well, other ones that you enjoy? I, I, lo I love micro museums. The funkier, the better. I mean, I, I, I just, you know, there's people who have transistor radio museums or old cooking stuff. I love when people co personally collect stuff that's meaningful to them. And however they display it is, is very interesting. I certainly love um, the museums in the gold country. A lot, mm. of the, uh, a lot of the towns have these very funky museums with all kinds of strange stuff from people's households in them. And I like them, they're, they're sometimes they're arranged on the wall. They have very interesting arrangements, but it's personal. I also love old curiosity cabinets. Um, there was one I found inside this very modern, kind of uninteresting library. They had taken someone's curiosity cabin. It took me forever to find it. Even the people in the building didn't know it was there. It was wow. like a hunt. And they had like you know a whole wall of curiosities. I mean, if anybody goes to France, I should try to find that place and send everyone there. It was gorgeous. It was wow. really fascinating. And um, there's a, a person's house in London I love, which is like a museum to me, Dennis Seaver's house. Don't know if, if you know that Dennis Seaver's house, when he was alive, he was kind of very theatrical person. He has a house in Spitalfields and um, he's made it um, as though the people have just left. So it's a home, but it has very interesting stuff in it. And it's all about atmosphere. So I, I, like, I like things like that. I don't like big museums. Yeah, a couple hundred years ago. He makes it a home like it was a couple hundred years ago with wow. sounds and smells and things to touch. And objects. What would be, if you had your own wonder cabinet, Mandy, what, what would be like the top five things you'd pop in there? I put, I have one. I have ambergris and musk in there. I have the real things. I have a pomander, which is something I always, always wanted. And this was a very special pomander. Pomanders are these um, very beautiful things that have holes in the bottom that people wore to, um, ward off the plague or took with them. And ours is from 1790 and it has a serpents on the bottom and opium poppies. And then it has a monkey playing the violin, which happens to be a line from First We Take Manhattan by Leonard Cohen. Wow. And it's got a little rubies and it's just kind of a magical, magical object. I also have patch boxes, which is something I've collected and they were used for patches 
um, that people wore. If you see those Marie Antoinette movies, people. Oh, you know, mean like the little. Yeah, like oh, yeah, yeah, the little patches that are like circles and stars. But we, I have ones of mythical animals. Um, I have a griffin. I have a satyr. I have a salamander. I have them with very magical things on it. We have a tray in there with the green man on it, who's a. Oh, nice. Um, the British. Yeah, so there's five of them on this. So we have very kind of trippy, otherworldly stuff in our cabinet of curiosities. Really cool. and, and we have a 1932 book of an artisan perfumer's formula book and all his notes about the essences. We have that in there too. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I love that, uh, that, uh, that focus on the tiny treasures that you have, which I think is pretty cool. Okay, so Mandy, you work in a way that you call uh, slow perfumery. Uh, can, can you just explain to everyone who might not know what that means? I did a, um, an, a cookbook about cooking and making products with essential oils with uh, Daniel Patterson, who is a two-star Michelin chef, and he did the food recipes in 2004. Mm -hmm. And at that time, um, we did a couple dinners for Slow Food, and I wrote an article called Slow Scent that was in their journal, uh, which was called The Snail. And I kind of labeled what I was doing Slow Scent at that time because they were asking about kind of what I did. And so what I defined it as is a focus on the quality of the ingredients in your perfume, the essences, and a focus on the hand of the maker because I'm very much about, as you know, about a handmade product and that the hand of the maker being in there as being a very important aspect to me of, of what I do and what I'm interested in. So, you know, kind of it's, that's, that's what it's about. And as you know, I'm not against synthetics, but I just really, really love natural essences. I see them actually as extremely different than synthetics. I see the way they are as elements to work with as being different. And I see their final outcome is different. I see it as a different practice. I see it as very different. If you work exclusively with naturals, it's just a different experience. And does it lend itself more to, to this sort of practice of slow perfumery, do you think? Or can slow yeah. perfumery also incorporate synthetics, I guess? Yes, yes. Okay. I, think it's, I think slow perfumery could, could in, include synthetics because I think it's more about the process of the maker and the attention of the maker and usually the smallness of them. Mm. I'm, very, I'm a big fan of the smallness yeah. of things and not the large uh, corporate aspects of perfumery. Well, okay, so... so. <laughs> and, and, ba and back in the 50s, you know, people worked with synthetics and naturals in a very, very... I mean, I have all the books uh, from every time and if you go back and you read those those books from that period where people were working a lot in synthetics in the 30s the 40s and the 50s they really were paying attention to the quality of ingredients and it comes across in their writing their reverence for naturals their interest in synthetics their liking of synthetics and their assessing of quality where it wasn't as much about capitalism and money yeah. Well, so, so what changed? I mean, what, what changed within the perfume industry from that time? Do you, I mean, where do you start? Right. But, <laughs> but, well, I mean, I only have my own opinion. I think perfume is very profitable. I think perfume is profitable. And I think profit is a main uh, driver of things and, and largeness when those are your values and those are what's most important to you, things just change. And um so I think as it got more and more profitable, um, they did certain things that I don't totally understand to make a whole lot of money. And the, the interest in the quality of things uh, went out the window. Yeah, it became, it became like a commodity versus an art, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, perfume has a very interesting history because um, first of all, people always started all with naturals long ago. And then synthetics came in and the people that work with synthetics early on, all these different people, they loved perfume and they loved working with it and they loved the ingredients and they loved the synthetics and the naturals. And then things as they moved along and got bigger and bigger, a lot of that just was, you know, got controlled by a few places that were very, yeah. very profitable and things really changed. And I think for the, from my perspective as a tiny person, the consumer got kind of left out. Yeah. 
I think the because I think people are really driven to want to include scent in their life. So I think that what the consumer was interested in and what big businesses were interested in didn't really match up. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting. As you know, I'm I'm a huge fan of synthetic materials. I think the the, the I think the history is really interesting. So, mm -hmm. but I think what you're nailing is it's not really about the natural versus synthetic. It's about sort of the the reverence for materiality versus you know sort of conglomerate push out of product, 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 right? Um, yes. But I feel like you really stand for is sort of a, a stand against that in a lot of ways, or aside from that, maybe as a more. I think when, when someone has an artistic practice and has a deep interest in the materiality of, of what they're using and has a artistic sensibility about what they're doing and an honesty about their, who they are and what they're doing, it's very different. And it doesn't really matter what that materiality is. You can feel that, yeah. that, that reality in what they're doing. And for me, it's about naturals. But for me, it's never been about whether a person uses naturals and synthetics. Mm. There are many people that use naturals that I also would yeah. want to keep a distance from. <laughs> Naming names? No, I'm kidding. No, just, Don't just, name just, names. Just like, oh my God, no. You know, yeah, yeah, no, I know. I, I get it. Yeah. So it's more of an approach, right? Like marketing approach versus art approach, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. to be as be, to be honest, to be honest in what you do and to add something to a person's life that you believe in, that you feel will be a positive thing in their life and it's worth the money. I think yeah. all that's as a is a very is a practice I have a lot of respect for. Yeah. How do you see uh, yourself? Vis-a-vis -vis the, the larger sort of global perfume industry, I mean, do you feel like you have a place in there or do you feel apart from it? Um, how do you relate to it, if at all, you know? I feel like I've been incredibly lucky to have the success I've been able to have because I don't feel a part of it. I really, I don't. I, 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 the, the, the really big perfume world, which has knocked on my door many times, I don't really feel a part of it. I don't, I don't have a, the same desires. I, I, I like, I like the practice of making things. I like being small. I like my connection to my students. I like everything to be small. I like what I make to be small. And I see the, the perfume is this, you know, big planet, huge planet. And I feel like I'm in some other little planet with people that share my values. I don't think I'm on that planet, you know, and I'm always like surprised if some, some, buddy on the big planet kind of knows about me because I feel like, God, how did they even hear of me really? So I, I don't see myself there. No. And yeah, you've, you know, you've, you've had excursions within it in the past. I think that maybe have con contributed to that feeling of being on your own planet. I, I, guess, I right? do. I do see people uh, and I see people very vocal about this really wanting uh, to be on that, the big planet of perfume and stuff. And it's a, it's a point of view I have no understanding of. I just mm. don't understand why anybody would want to be there, really. It's so wonderful now, being small. It's so wonderful. I, in part from what you've done, having an award for handmade perfume, that was nothing like that when I started. Mm. I'm so grateful you have that. There's so much room now for personal expression and for people who uh, really love what they do and love the materials. The world has changed since I started 25 years ago to be so inclusive of so many different kinds of practices and so many different sorts of cultures and things. It's really changed in such yeah. a wonderful way. I don't know why anyone would wanna join that big world. This is a little bit of an off topic question, but, uh, but it's something that you and I have been talking about, you know, privately, mm -hmm. um, which is, so how, how are you relating to sort of um, how people are communicating about perfume uh, on the internet, for instance, or, I mean, do you feel like, do you think there's a way of elevating the discourse a little bit? Um, I would love that. I, yeah. I, I, go, I go on the internet and I'm terrified. Yeah. I really am. There's so much meanness. There's so much, uh, there's so much dishonesty. And there's so much, I feel like leading people toward things that are large and corporate that they don't really want. Mm. I feel like, um, I feel concerned like for my students. <laughs> I talk mm. about that in my class. I feel concerned for them. I feel like there's so much room now to have a practice that's meaningful to you and to find your way to customers or students or 
essays or whatever it is that you enjoy and it's meaningful to you and find your own world in that. That was when I started that you had to be in the glossy magazines or a few department stores. It was very different mm -hmm. when I first began. And I feel concerned at the kind of uh, um, kind of scare tactics that I see going on at times on the internet that feel scary to me by people who feel to me like they want to assemble people in some way that uh, may not be good for them. Right. But right. in general, for me, I keep my head down. Yeah, I think that's, I can't blame you. <laughs> or, 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 hide under, or hide under my bed. Yeah, yeah I've definitely had those days where I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to delete this Instagram app altogether. Um, yeah, it's a tricky thing because like you have a public practice, you know, you teach people, you have a museum, you're a published author, you know. Right. And yet, you know, you're a very private person and one can extrapolate to all of us. We all have a public practice and a private personhood. And sometimes it's really hard to sort of reconcile the, the public personas with, with, with how you, I guess, want to be or want to think people are and stuff. It's, it's really tricky. I think it's a very new problem, right? It's a very, um, I, I tend to keep what I put out there to, um, dedicated to my work, but I do teach these small classes and I am much more intimate in those classes, I, the class is very serious to me. Mm -hmm. And I do try to speak of values in my classes. I feel values are the most important thing in life, actually. Yeah. Yeah. They, they lead you to absolutely everything. So I do, I do do that there, but it's not my way to do that in a public forum anyway. <laughs> why, so is that why you teach, Mandy? Is it to sort of transmit those values um, in, a, in, a, in a gentle way or a more gentle way? No, I, I feel working with naturals is really, really interesting. So I, I feel like um, I teach because working with naturals takes a certain kind of rigorous thinking. It's a very intellectual process. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sensual, but it's intellectual, and it's a lot around editing and understanding material. So I enjoy that, and I taught for 20 years in my studio, a very small class, and now I teach um, Zoom, which I think some of my students who haven't come to Zoom think it will be not as good, but it's actually a million times better. So I have a chance in my teaching to look at the building blocks and the, the, uh, the, the way perfumes come together for the 10 people in my class. And I have them make and remake a perfume in my class very quickly. And then we all go over it. So there's no uh, interest in making something good. There's much more interest in the dynamics of the perfume materials and which I feel perfume or writing is an entire process of editing, that it's all around knowing how to work with what you've done. So I like that process and I like teaching. And along the way, I share my values as well about the non-competitiveness, about wanting to edit your work, about wanting to get good at stuff and about wanting to learn the materials as personalities piece by piece and hopefully giving people some guidelines about how to begin that thinking process. So I like it. I really, really like teaching and, mm. I, and I keep learning. They might be learning in class, but I'm learning right along with them. Yeah. I really am. It's, a, it's, it's very interesting to me. So I, I like teaching a lot. Just a couple of uh, thoughts from the chat. So it, um... Uh, uh, Lisa says, Mandy, I'm so grateful for the small planet. I don't connect with big planet perfume. I think we may have coined a term here, <laughs> big planet perfume. Yes, really. <laughs> and then yeah, Adrian, hi, Adrian. Adrian says, for the art to regain its position, I think today's perfumers and enthusiasts must have a certain distance from the market. I, I totally agree with that. And great Please perspective, agree. says he. Yes. Um, we had one more question, but I think it's a great time to segue to some questions from our crew. So I, I have one that's a little bit from before, which is Chris Peavy actually is asking a very specific question about a material. Have you ever worked with skunk musk? <laughs> I've been tempted. <laughs> I, I, I have two. I had two experiences with skunk. Um, once was I bought from a trap or a pod and I could tell he was trying to talk me out of it. And mm -hmm. I, and I bought it anyway. You don't want this lady. I bought it. He kept telling me, you know, and I bought it. And and we got it here. And um, I, I can't describe how unbelievably strong it was. I was kind of in awe. It felt yeah. like, like, the you know, the 10th wonder of the world. And it was terrible. 
And so I decided I was going to like tincture it. I don't know what I thought I was going to do. I got one drop and I put it in a, like a kilo of alcohol <laughs> and it was so awful. It was like there was Crazy. a stuck in the neck and I had it outdoors. It went through the walls into my house and stuff. And I like skunk. Like if yeah. I drive by a skunk, I will roll my windows down. I like the way skunk smells a lot, but we had to take it to like a special place to get rid of it. So that was my one skunk experience. And then I do have something called skunk here that's from, um, that doesn't smell like that at all. That's a hundred years old and maybe it just got more mellow, but they use skunk for something. So no, I haven't used it, but I'm interested in it, but it's too strong. That's my yeah. answer. I haven't worked out what to do. My, my, uh, Micah, my husband drove, th hit a skunk, no, drove, clipped a skunk, didn't even hit the skunk, just like touched it on the street a couple months ago. And that, that little touch, that little thing of musk lasted in his car for like three weeks and then translated from his car to my car. And yeah. my eyes were, I mean, it was crazy. It's so potent. It's so brutal. So yeah, I don't blame you for uh, putting it, it outside. <laughs> it was real, but I kind of also, like I feel about a lot of the materials, I stand in awe of it. I just, yeah. it's so interesting that something could smell like that. You know, really, it just yeah, it warrants respect. Me. You know that yes. this little animal figured out this this evolution. To, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, I I want to ask actually our last question because I think it's important. So you you you've also been training teachers to teach for for a long time now, um, using your slow scent approach. Uh, yes. So so what is the importance of this work for you, Mandy? Like this the te training teachers to teach, I guess again. Uh I, I taught a beginning class in a lot of public places for many, many years. And in it, I kind of ironed out all the kinks of the class because I taught it so many times, which materials to bring, what to say, what to do. And the idea that I wanted people to have an experience making a perfume with natural essences where they had a nice perfume to take home. Mm -hmm. So they, everything was very vetted. Everything was very streamlined. I had taught it at Esalen for a long time, but I had also taught it at Apple to the design team. I taught it in a lockdown facility in the place for the blind, the homeless. I taught it in a lot of places and I started to just teach it to my students with no remuneration. It was just something I give them to do. And then they went out and taught it to people in a way to bring that into people's lives. So I teach them how to teach a class that everyone will make a good perfume. And they use that for livelihood, for charity. I have one of my students who teaches it to trafficked women and abused women all over, does an incredible job with that. Um, some of them teach it to uh, do this class in wedding parties. They do that um, to help do their business. It just seemed to me a jewel that I had figured out how to do and that other people could use in their practice in the world to identify themselves in a community and build community around themselves. And so I gave that to them because I thought it was a good idea. Cool. And, and do, you, do you are a lot of people doing it right now? Like you said, you had a few people. There are a lot of people doing it. I've taught a lot of people. I've uh, And so people are doing it all over the world. Yeah. And very recently, I've always had the trademark slow scent. I've had that since I made up the word. And so those people that have studied with me, their class is called slow scent. So people know that's exactly the practice that they'll be getting. And um, they use some of the little advanced tools that I have, like the book or whatever things that I've put together. So their class runs smoothly and then they add their own into it. You know, everybody kind of adds their own, own part of it into it. But I, I like that it's being done for, um, for remuneration, but also for uh, disadvantaged people yeah, who yeah. have no have no access to that. And yeah. once somebody has the class, it's their own thing. It's not like uh, it's not like a pyramid scheme. It doesn't doesn't ever come back to me really. It just goes on with them. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I think I, a couple of the folks who are teaching it are in this audience right now. So. Hi guys. Um, cool. Well, so guys, do we have any questions for Mandy? I mean, I can keep asking. I know her well, and I have plenty of questions, but um, I'm no longer terrified. Please ask questions. <laughs> well, I had one uh, sent to me by, by Miles earlier. So do you have a signature scent, uh, even if it's your own? Something that you like that, well, Memento, for instance. I, I like, um, yeah, I have a, I have a, a scent I made 
called Memento Mori that I made um, about someone that I lost and it's a very sad perfume. Um, and I made it out of grief and sadness. And, um, and when I first made it, it got the world's most awful review. They compared it um, to, um, I think, I don't remember, to some kind of rotten cheese. <laughs> it was really terrible. I've gotten some very good reviews of my work and some real stinkers for real. And I thought, and then it's gone on and it's been very interesting. It's found its way into people's lives. And I feel they feel the sadness. It's kind of a message in a bottle and, and it smells like a person. And that perfume uh, is, is very special to me. And another one that's special to me, the special ones to me are not necessarily the most successful ones, is a, a perfume of mine called Sepia, which um, smells to me like the gold country, which I like, mm -hmm. I like the gold rush. I like California. I think I grew up on Westerns in the Midwest and I kind of loved the West. And, and thought it was amazing. And the gold rush, even though there's a million problems with it, I thought it was so interesting that the gold rush was over before all the people came to it. And I love Deadwood. So I made this perfume kind of about my, my fantasy of the West. And I like that perfume. It smells like old wood. I, I'm familiar. And I, as a Northern California person, I appreciate uh, that you love the 49ers. <laughs> I do. I do. I love, I love all that. And I love things that are falling apart. Yeah, I do. I like things better that are falling apart than are, that are pristine. Um, I had a stupid joke, but I won't go there because uh, I was going to say you are from Detroit after all. No, I, am, Detroit. I am from Detroit. <laughs> Please don't be offended, anybody. I love Detroit. Um, okay, so Jess says, Mandy, you've been an absolute force on the path of, of the last 40 years. Sorry, by Jess, I mean Jessica Manella. Hey, Jessica. Yes. Uh, for the last 40 years of perfume and where perfume is headed. If you were to envision the next 20 years for the perfume world, what would you like to, what would you hope to see happen? Happen? I, I feel like there's a, a split between the perfume world and the consumer. So I, I feel like, and you must see this at the IAO. I feel like just regular people out there are really hungry for what perfume and scent can do for them. And they are getting more and more educated and more and more interested and more and more interested in independent perfumers and um, things they can do and ways they can integrate it into their lives. And so I think as that happens, I think it will catch up with food. Hmm. I think that that a lot of the innovation and things come from outside the main corporate perfume community. I think that's lost a lot of its luster. And I think customers are very, very interested in connecting with, in, in my, from my palate, the natural world and plants or creativity or things that people are doing that they believe in. And I feel that there's just more and more um, education and interest to take place in that area and that it's just moving of its own accord because it's because it's a right practice because it's a right practice for people to be in so mm -hmm. I feel like it's become more and more attractive since when I began and it will keep going that way and I feel like um, more honesty would be good <laughs> people telling the truth more always a good idea that would be kind of great hold your breath Mandy <laughs> But I, I, I would, I would like to see that, and I see, I see it a bit. You know, I think that there could be more cho choices, more individual connections. I think that all can take place. I don't think that's impossible. Um, Adrian's actually asking a question that I think is pretty interesting, which is how can we uh, make? So it's not just about the perfume; it's also about the people that supply the perfumers. You know, so he's asking how uh, you think we can make artisan distilleries and suppliers more visible. I think that, you know, there are a lot of dis people distilling now. I mean, that's something that's changed too. And uh, people collecting materials. I think they have gotten more visible. I don't know exactly how to, because I, I personally am not an organizer of big things, but I, I feel like the better educated people are and the more honest they are and the more they point to the source of things, the more visibility that that has. Right. That, so sharing that, our suppliers maybe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think all of that is a really, is a really good idea. I think people being more honest about what goes in their perfume, that would be useful too. So, so Lisa's wondering, will you ever create a perfume version of ancient resins or does it just work better as a body oil? Ancient, I, you know, I do. I make everything in all ways. Like I've made it as a perfume. 
ancient resins. I, I start out in my mind tying something I'm making to the form that it's in. But if anybody writes me and says, you know, I like that liquid perfume, will you make it a solid? I say, yes. I say, or I like that body, or will you make it as a perfume? I say, yes. So I do onesie twosies from people writing to me. I do do onesie twosies of things that I've probably made every liquid perfume as a solid. And I've made a lot of the solid perfumes as liquids. So just ask if you want something. Um, okay, we have time just for one more question. I'm so sorry, everyone. And I'm going to end uh, with a very fanciful question, which is uh, great. So Carol, Carol, sorry, uh, asks, Mandy, you've always inspired me with your connection to the timelessness of natural materials, segueing to the question, which is if you could go back in time to experience them, which era would you want to be transported to and which materials would be top of your list? It's a fantastic question, Carol. <laughs> let, me, let me think of a, of a real answer of what I would want to be. Where would you want to go? What time and, and what would you want to smell? Well, you know, there was this very interesting guy in India. When was he? 1300s? 1400s in India. A uh, very forward thinking guy. I discovered him. Do you, do you, his book is over there. I don't know if you'll find it. Very forward thinking guy. He was a ruler in India and he decided he didn't want to be a ruler anymore. And he ended up making women uh, giving women all of these, it's not that the real book is over there. Oh, um, and um, he there's one copy of his cookbook in the British Museum, and in his cookbook, he was whoever was doing that food. It's this, it's an incredible book. It's called The Sultan of Mandu, and the the, the recipes which they have uh, translated in the front, they're like perfumes, and they say in the recipes. Put it on your body or eat it. I'm not sure you wouldn't wow. die because it's that, but they were very particular. They had civet, they had musk, they had ambergris, they had all this stuff in their food. And they would say, you know, use this kind of rose and use just the kind of specificity I love in working with naturals. The bitter orange is different than blood orange, and blood orange is different than sweet orange. All those little facets, each one that moves the perfume in a certain direction they seem to be on it so i'd want to go back there and eat dinner that's awesome <laughs> with the sultan of mandu and the he salt made, in, yeah, in he the made mandu. women he made women in charge of everything he abdicated when he took over he abdicated and he made women the head of everything this guy was so interesting so that's where i'd go the book is called well, it's got some word I can't pronounce. Nimbachnama. I'll put that in the uh, chat. The Sultan, Sultans of Mandu, and under okay. it says, The Sultan's Book of Delights. How okay. can you not like that title? The Sultan's Book of Delights. Well, cool, Mandy. That's it. We got it. We got through it. One hour of your time. I really appreciate you, you doing this. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming and listening to me for an hour. It's a miracle. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Saskia, for hosting it. Thank you for having a handmade perfume world. Please never get rid of it. Please, no. please never get rid of it. I think I would get killed on the internet if I got rid of it, Mandy. Don't, Don't get worry. Rid of it, it's please. Safe. You're the only one. I want to share with you that Jessica Manella says, thank you, Mandy Saskia. This was an absolute pun intended joy. And with that delightful pun, we're going we're gonna to call it a day. Thanks, Jess, for that. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone.